Let's revisit Kepler's second law. And this is a powerful statement. It says that a line joining a planet and a sun, or two objects, one object or orbiting another, sweeps out equal area in equal time interval. Well, words are nice. We can say all the statements we want, but this is physics. We gotta actually back ourselves up on this. So we're gonna go through a little bit of the derivation of this. And when we do this, we're gonna we can't do this for elliptical orbits. We're actually going to do it for a circular orbit. The math is just a little bit e uh, easier. You can do the appropriate one or the similar one for elliptical. It just is a lot more complicated. So here is kind of a taste of what this derivation looks like. So it says we need to figure out the area of the triangle in smaller time steps. So we're going to look at that small time step that this thing goes through. So Give us our picture. We're going to look through and see the area of this triangle. So I'm going to concentrate on this red triangle here. And the area of the triangle here is given by, if I assume that this is a small little area, so this little distance in here is essentially insignificant because we're our triangle is a very small little wedge of this. The area of a triangle is one half the base times the height. Well, my base of my triangle is one of my radiuses, and the height of my triangle is essentially the path that I go along here. It's really the vertical height here. So it's one half base times height. Well, one half times my radius, this is my base, and my height is a little bit of a tricky thing. The amount of distance that I travel along this path, and there's a little bit of an approximation, but if I go to small enough things, the two become equal, it just says that the radius that I go out, two times the change of the angle that I see, uh, is equal to this height, this distance. So really, it's this is the equation of the tangential um, path that I've uh, drawn out, where I change my angle, this little angle here, times the height. Well, this is nice because we know that the change of an angle is equal to the angular velocity, how fast we're going around this circular orbit, times the change of the time that we do. And this time is going to be a small time, and this equation works out to be one half from before, the r squared value, and then we get omega t, omega delta t is equal to our delta t. So we also know that the angular we also know that the angular momentum of the system is given by this quantity L. Well, L is equal to m r uh, v perpendicular. So the velocity in the perpendicular direction times m r. Uh, it's a little bit of a different form of um, this that you might have seen or may have not seen yet. But for in terms of Angular momentum, how much angular momentum does it have? Uh, it's mr v perpendicular. Well, v perpendicular is nothing more, again, than the angular velocity and the um, times the radius. So the radius times the angular velocity gives us our tangential or our perpendicular velocity. So L is equal to mr squared omega. Well, we combine these two equations and we start to look and see what's similar. We can see that we get an r squared here and an omega there. We have an r squared and an omega there. The same r squared is the same omega. So we're going to combine the two. And we'll see that the area is equal to the angular momentum. There's a factor of 1 half that still shows up. We still have to count for our mass, so our mass shows up, and the time or our area over our change of time, the amount of area we sweep out in a particular amount of time is equal to L over M, over M or over 2M, sorry. The area is uh, per unit time is equal to the angular momentum divided by 2M. Well, for an orbit, the torque is zero. For a circular orbit, the torque is zero. We can make a similar argument for uh, this for uh, elliptical orbits, but for a circular orbit, L is equal to, uh, uh, the torque is equal to zero. 
which it would imply that the moment, the angular momentum is constant. So if the torque is constant or zero, then the L is constant. And this in turn is that L is constant, M is constant, our mass hasn't changed, which means A over delta T have to be constant. So if we measure equal times, we have to get equal areas. So this is a little bit of a taste of how the derivation for angular momentum uh, plays a role in how we get this equal area and equal time concept and why we get Kepler's second law. Full-blown version of it is a little bit more complicated, but it follows almost identical arguments.